If you own the transactions, if you know what your clients are spending money on, you are holding a powerful tool in your hands. Vietnam and, and the Southeast Asian countries have skipped this, and they have moved directly from essentially having nothing in the span of 10 years, having the world at their fingertips in their phones. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Vacuum, where we go through war stories of people founding fintechs, working in the vacuum of space and time to build something that brings value to the world. And today I'm very happy to have uh, Branjo Vargits uh, from Home Credit Vietnam with us today. Welcome, Branjo. Thank you for having me. So you were previously the head of HR for a Slovak bank. So how does someone that used to be the head of HR end up being the COO of Home Credit Vietnam? What's the story there? It's been a journey, that is for sure. I was in HR field for almost 15 years. I spent roughly six years in academia in the field of HR and organizational behavior. I was hired by a global consulting company at that time, and we did a lot of work with a number of clients essentially around the globe, around issues of leadership, compensation, all of the things that are somehow under the umbrella of, of human resources. Consultants very often don't get to do the implementation, or as we used to say, after giving a birth to a baby, you actually see the baby grow. So I joined Tatra Banka as a head of human resources, and, and I spent wonderful four, four and a half years there. But by the end of my tenure there, um, I was ready to leave HR field. I moved to Prague within the same banking group and while I happened to be in Prague and the project was long term, it was uh, almost a three year, three year long project, but it was time limited. And, and at the end of or towards the end of the project, uh, I got uh, headhunted. I was approached by Home Credit for a different position, but that position required quite a bit of traveling. So I refused because at that time I had uh, my third child born, my son. When they came back to me a few weeks later and they said, how about Vietnam? for a position of uh, head of operations or the COO. And I went home and talked to my wife and uh, my wife said, yes, let's go. So we went. <laughs> so what surprised you the most when you arrived? You land in Vietnam. What's the big, big thing that surprises you there? Essentially, everything surprised me. I didn't know what to expect, but what amazed me or what was the first shocker, so to speak, was that the economy is fast paced, growing, booming enormous development and growth. Vietnamese economy, until uh, COVID happened, was growing roughly at, a, at the rate of about 7% per year, at the GDP. And, and you can essentially see it. You can see it in the streets. You can see it with the intensity of, of economic activity. You can see it with the intensity of life. I was absolutely positively surprised by the warmth uh, of Vietnamese. I, and I am up to this day very much surprised by how smiley they are and how positive uh, they are in terms of their approach to life. I think that the regulation is a bit heavier than what I was used to in, uh, in EU, or let's say it's, it's directed a little bit differently than what it is in EU, wh whether it's GDPR or, or some of those elements. But generally speaking, uh, yes, I was surprised that, that it was, if you didn't know that it was a country that was a bit of a different regime than the Western world, if you will, then you wouldn't know it by a daily activity and looking at the economy and, and what was happening with the society, you would not know it. Can you give a sort of high level under, uh, explanation of what home credit is for those who don't know and how it is different in Vietnam? Home credit is essentially consumer finance company. And, and what that means is that we are a non-banking institution, or at least home credit Vietnam is, because we have other business units worldwide uh, where in some of the countries where home credit is present, we are a bank. So we are able to collect deposits, if I should simplify it. Uh, but in Vietnam, we are not. Our business model is relatively very simple. We are a credible institution globally that borrows money from large financial institutions worldwide and from a number of them at certain rates. And then we take that money and uh, where we are really good at, and which is our total and absolute competitive advantage in any against any competition that we have, not even locally, but worldwide, is that we are very equipped and we have a vast knowledge of underwriting processes, which in other words means uh, we are able to analyze customers' behavior and predict how disciplined they will be in terms of paying back. Based on these multiple analyses, we are then able to say this particular person, we can feel 
very secure about giving a loan at certain percent because we know or we have high probability that he or she will pay back uh, and vice versa. This particular person, we cannot lend the money to. The business model is relatively very simple. Like I said, we borrow money from large financial institutions. And then what we do, we have two separate or actually three separate uh, uh, business directions, if you will. One is a very classical installment programs. And we know this from Central Europe. It was very popular in the mid-90s and, and, and it still exists. And that is, you come to a store, you want to buy a phone, um, and there are several providers that can provide you with the loan for that phone that comes in the form of installment. Very often, it's 0% interest rate and relatively short tenure. So our average, average loan for a device like a phone or like a, a tablet is roughly six months. And, and very often, it's 0% interest rate if you put down certain uh, amount of down payment. And this is, for our customers, this is the entry, the entry way into our home credit world. Uh, because based on their behavior, while paying back uh, these installments, that's one of the sources of information that we then use to, to analyze uh, their potential for bigger loans. And then we are able to provide them and, and address them with the opportunity to uh, take a greater loan. And still greater, we are talking about one to two thousand euros. We're not talking about we're not talking about massive mortgages or something like that. And then we offer them these loans, and very often they take it. And the third stream is credit cards, because essentially credit card is a revolving loan, and we are offering to our clients also credit card services uh, that have different features and uh, different cashback programs and so on and so forth. Is there anything you needed to do as you entered Vietnam or as the company entered Vietnam and continues to grow in Vietnam? Is there a different approach compared to other countries or more specifically the home base, which is Central Europe? There are many differences, but they are stemming from, they are stemming from the character of the economy. Um, uh, one for sure is the size of the market. Vietnam has almost 100 million people. And so that, that enables you in comparison to Czech Republic or Slovakia, which home credit now in, in those two countries is, is essentially one entity that enables you to have a much greater impact and address much greater portfolio of clients. We are roughly at the moment, or actually at any moment uh, in time, we have somewhere between two to 2.5 million active customers. That would also be like, uh, that would al almost be like uh, having a half of uh, Slovakia customer. So, so that's one thing, the, the size of the market, it's definitely a, a different filter. The other thing that I, that I feel, and, and now I can comfortably say so after three years here, is the level of digitalization, uh, not only of our services, but generally speaking, the expectations of our customers in terms of how digital our services are. We are essentially a, a, a financial company, and, and uh, yeah, the level of digitalization is certainly the expectation of the market of what they can do and how they can apply for our loan on the phone or on any other device is much greater. And the third one, which I think is a, it's a differentiator, let me put it this way. When I, look at the, when I look at the financial sector in Vietnam right now, and I look at the, the large banking houses, majority of which are owned, or majority of them are owned by, by the state, uh, the financial sector very much reminds me of financial sector in Central Europe, roughly somewhere around 1995 to 2000, right before, for example, if I use the example of Slovakia, roughly before the banks were privatized in the early 2000s, which what that means is that the banks, especially the retail banks, are relatively slow. They have relatively old systems. Of course, people have bank accounts, but, but generally speaking, the banks are not so flexible and not so up to par in terms of the, the digitalization. Now, of course, they are slowly but surely jumping on that wave. But the main difference between uh, mid to late 1990s in Europe and here is the fact that we have internet and what that what that creates or what that has created in vietnam is this environment of a relatively vast economic space or gap into which many players jumped in because they started to understand that hey if the big banks are slow and if the big banks don't provide the services that that the general public wants we will do that if you own the transactions if you know what your clients are banking with or banking on or, or spending money on, you are holding a powerful tool in your hands to, again, to be able to predict their behaviors, to be able to analyze their, their spending patterns and to be able to go into lending business. It, it, it's a whole ecosystem of digital payments, if I should put it that way, 
And of course, then from the digital payments, you lead to e-commerce and how the major players in the e-commerce area are then linked with the e-wallets. Very often, there are a number of examples in the market where it's a conglomerate. I will mention one called C Group, which is a Singaporean major player who not only operates the biggest e-commerce portal in Vietnam, which is Shopee, which is it's a combination. It's a combination of Amazon with eBay. So not only merchants but also private individuals can do their selling on there, and they have their own, uh, they have their own e-wallet. So the platform of e-wallet then is connected with the with their e-commerce site, uh, and of course then you can start promoting your e-wallet, saying for example if you pay from your e-wallet that belongs to Shopee, which is called AirPay, um, then you can get a discount and so on and so forth. So you incentivize the clients to actually do the transactions through your e-wallet, and that's how you get to their transactions. So. It's an ecosystem that is massive, and that's not only the case of Vietnam, but that's also the case of many other South, uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia countries, that there is huge ecosystems. And uh, again, they don't, especially on the parts of uh, e-wallet, but not only on e-wallets, there is massive investments that are coming into these companies from abroad, whether that's uh, China or it's Korea or it's Japan, massive rounds of investments and of funding that these, that these players are investing into these companies. I'm sorry to all of my European friends, but I certainly would not say innovation is coming from Europe to here. Asia, in my personal observation and feeling, Asia is quite a bit ahead um, uh, of Europe in the area of digital payments and the area of, well, what they call here super apps. And, and, and I think that the best example of a super app that is an inspiration for many players is a company called Grab. Grab. Grab is a major player now. Just a fun fact, Grab purchased Uber in Southeast Asia two years ago. Uber was here, it was present, and it was rather strong, and, and Grab just essentially acquired them. Grab today is a super app that has financial services. They have their own, own e-wallet. Actually, it's a white-label e-wallet that they bought, so it's called Mocha by Grab. They have food delivery service. They have uh, taxi hailing part of the application and all within one app. I have that app installed. It's absolutely fantastic in terms of what it can do. And, and they keep on building it and, and adding services that are not necessarily financial services anymore. They didn't start as a financial service, but they are building, again, they are building an ecosystem where you don't need to leave the app and all of your life functions, if you will, can be satisfied there. Whether it's shopping, whether it's uh, going somewhere, whether it's uh, paying for something or essentially getting a loan. What would you say some, are some other interesting fintechs or financial service providers in the region? There are many brand names. In the world of, of e-wallets and payments through e-wallets, the biggest player in Vietnam is a company called Momo, which is an abbreviation for mobile money. Momo at the moment has roughly 12 million registered users. They do operate only in Vietnam, but, but they, have, they have accumulated another round of investment just recently, and they really want, they really have expansion interests. Lazada is a regional player. Lazada is a big e-commerce site, and it's present in five or six countries around Vietnam, as well as in Vietnam. Same with Shopee and Tiki. Those are the three major players in the area of e-commerce. Lazada, 30% or, or more, if I'm not mistaken, is owned by is owned by Alibaba. So Alibaba, Alibaba is a huge player in the region and not necessarily that Alibaba would deliver everywhere, but Alibaba invests into companies like Lazada and so on and so forth. And yes, WeChat as well. One of the reasons where I see that there's a potential consolidation still will be happening in Vietnam in the area of e-wallets is because the major players are afraid of WeChat and afraid of Alibaba to come in and, and, and overtake because they certainly have the financial means to do so. so the consolidation will mean that they will the 19 players will consolidate into six bigger ones and and then they will be stronger against the chinese competition so that's in the area of uh, that's in the area of of e-commerce i already mentioned c group is pretty big because it owns shopee it, it also owns airplay airpay which is an e-wallet and c group is originally from singapore if i'm not mistaken so there is many grab now we have grab and some other some other uh, delivery services in Vietnam, digital deliveries are very popular. And there is there's companies like Lala Move and many others that all they do is they deliver on motorbikes. You are able to order their services to deliver certain things. They are very often B2B business. 
But of course, if they're a B2B business and, and they have a well-established mobile application, then sooner or later you will get into the business of transactions. And, and I think that's what everybody is after in the ecosystem uh, of fintechs is how do we get uh, our hands on the transactions? Do you think that is part of the reason why the innovation is so ahead in the region, that there's just so much opportunity that it's just, it's very hard not to go after it? Or is there something else about the fact that things like Grab, like WeChat and others can thrive in, in the region? That's a very good question. I think that the size of the market plays a role, but I think there are two other factors that are even stronger. One is Asians are very playful and they're very playful. I can see it at work. Sometimes sometimes I have a feeling that these adults that are around me and my, for example, my direct reports are on average age 40, but they have this element to them where they really like to play. They really like to have fun. And I think that adds to the, or that contributes to the fact that they, their adoption of innovations, uh, because they somehow see element of playfulness behind those innovations, is very strong. I, I think that uh, Europe uh, is a bit more conservative on that part. And of course, we have to scale it down. It, if I look at Vietnam, it's a specific generation. Uh, there's obviously a large amount of 100 million people that are living in rural areas. And it's still a very strong cash economy. But the generation of 20 plus to 30 plus that is growing massively right now in Vietnam is definitely a generation of digital era. And the other element that I would mention is, which I think that played a massive role and still is playing a massive role. And I can speak more for Vietnam than for the APEC region as a whole, but I think that it could be generalized for other countries, is the fact that they, they skipped the era of the PC. Seven or eight years ago, Facebook was forbidden in Vietnam. So they, they jumped from, I remember myself in late 1990s, the, the first big PC that cost a fortune and, and had 486 kilobytes <laughs> RAM. Vietnam and, and the Southeast Asian countries, has, they have skipped this. And they have moved directly from essentially having nothing in the span of 10 years, having uh, the world at their fingertips in their phones. So what that means is, at, at least in my view, is that the companies... That would, that would try to develop software for computers or, th or that would try to develop something on a computer just jumped directly to the phones. And there's a massive advantage with the phones in comparison to the computer. You can carry it with you. I see literally pictures in Vietnam on a daily basis where you will have a person who will be laying in the hammock that is tied up to two lamp poles. And you can tell that this is a guy who makes, you know, 10 million Vietnamese dong, which is roughly 300, uh, uh, three to 400 euros per month probably paid works construction, pays cash, or is paid in cash, but he's laying in his hammock in the evening, and if it's not a rainy season, he will spend the night there, and there's an Apple phone in his hand. And, and, you know, he's browsing, he's doing his stuff, whatever he's doing. Yes, what you also see, which is a negative side, or I think it will be a negative side, people that spend, that spend all day on their phones. But, what, but that sort of behavior, I think, that has made many companies here very quickly aware of the fact I need to go into the app world and I need to go start building the apps because there's people that are spending time on it. And one of the reasons why they're spending time on the phone so much is because they were forbidden to do five, seven, ten years ago. And now they are just absolutely mesmerized by what they can find and how they can read about the world. And so that's I think that's one of the main reasons behind the speed of, of digitalization. And one of the things that you announced as home credit that I saw in the press was that you started to virtualize your support centers as a company. Is, is that part of, of uh, a, a more concentrated effort to address a larger and larger audience without having to significantly also scale physical support people? Yes, absolutely. And quite frankly, quite frankly, in, in some aspects, we are a bit behind. We have launched three, four months ago, VoiceBot service. And with VoiceBot technology, we are, yeah, we are front runners um, in the market. VoiceBot essentially means that we are replacing for some calls that are relatively standardized. We are replacing humans by a machine, but the VoiceBot technology and the AI behind it today um, is a completely different story than what it was you know, five years ago. You, you hear a voice that essentially sounds like a human, and the, the learning that the AI system is doing continuously in terms of being able to uh, properly analyze and, and properly record the answers uh, of the customers uh, because first you begin with the voice setup where you teach it that yes means yes, 
But then gradually you also teach it that not only yes means yes, but also yeah. And yes, I agree uh, and agree. And yes, the, all of those things are within the category of yes. So that's how the learning happens. But the plan is that in 2021, we will also launch a chatbot, which I think that would actually be even a greater game changer for home credit than the voice bot. Because like I said, people... People are very much on their phones and they are spending a lot more time on their phone texting than they are calling. So once we launch this service and, and the chatbot will be in there, I think that we'll see massive, massive exodus from our calling and switch to chatting. And again, the scale is definitely, definitely worth mentioning. Uh, in my call center, I have a part of, my, part of the things that I manage is a call center. Uh, we do inbound and outbound calls. Our outbound calls are welcome calls, which is part of the onboarding process for the client. And obviously, inbound calls are calls that the customers are calling with some issues and inquiries that they have. I have roughly right now about 200,000 inbound calls every month. And I make roughly about 250,000 outbound calls every month. And uh, at the moment, uh, we are pushing through VoiceBot out of those 250,000 outbound calls, roughly about 120. So again, the numbers, the numbers are massive. One thing that we learned the hard way is that different languages require different level of ability of the voice, but to understand the spoken word. And for example, Vietnamese is a, is a rather complex, complex language. It has many different dialects, north and south and, and the middle of the country, highlands. So for example, one of the things that we had to do that other countries didn't have to do as much was to actually have the recordings in three different dialects and then being able to depict based on the calling list, depict who is calling from where and try to utilize that particular dialect and vice versa, teach the voice bot to understand three different dialects. So the language element in terms of voice bot was very different. The other thing that, but again, this, is, this goes back to my little little piece on, on playfulness of Asians, in, uh, generally speaking. Gamification. Gamification uh, is something that this market wants, maybe a little bit more than Indonesian, maybe a little bit less than Philippines, but generally speaking, gamification is a huge part of your branding and of how you get customers interested and how you get them interested into coming into your mobile space, your mobile application. So that's one of the things that we are right now contemplating and, 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 and thinking about very strongly. How do we expand on what we have in our mobile app and get away a little bit from from just the payment services if i should put it that way and add an element of gamification or a marketplace that would that would interest larger traffic and that's another big topic of discussion and that is how do you connect the gamification with the loyalty program so how do we create a loyalty program that would have some element of gamification, whether, whether you create your loyalty points and those can be exchanged somewhere else for something else and so on and so forth. If you had to give one, two or three recommendations to a European player based on what you know in the market that is happening in Vietnam, what would you tell them? Come here for three months. Send someone here for three months. Number two, be prepared for a certain level of bureaucracy, especially if you were interested in setting up uh, the business here or expanding into this part of the world. Be prepared for a certain level of bureaucracy that might uh, be a little bit daunting at the times and, and be flexible. You have to be able to adapt because things are here, things are really fast paced and they are changing very often. If I look at a different kind of a player, so for example, one of your, your customers, be it B2B, let's say any major banking house, for example, I think that the recommendation is and I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to use the word agile because I think that it has become just a bit of a cliche. But the element behind agile approach to uh, development and to piloting and to being quick in terms of testing things in the market is definitely something that I would recommend. If, if you need to be able to transform your development to be even quicker than it is today and to be able to spit out things into the market and test them as quickly as possible. If it doesn't go, throw it away on to the next. So the, the big message to take away is come there, come to the region, come to see what it's like and come to experience it for yourself because nobody can actually explain how big and fast the, the growth is in the region. I can describe it all I want and maybe just one, one more little example. Every morning or almost every morning when I walk to the office, there's, a, there's an old lady, uh, old Vietnamese lady, 
in your typical Vietnamese uh, hat, um, standing with her little cart, and she sells banh mi. Banh mi is a Vietnamese subway sandwich, essentially. And so she's standing there in the corner. I, every morning or every other morning, I, I buy a breakfast banh mi sandwich. This lady, I'm not sure this lady is able to read. However, she has a mobile phone. And when I purchase my banh mi sandwich, the way that I pay to her is she shows me on her mobile phone a QR code. And I scan the QR code with my phone that automatically connects me to my e-wallet. My e-wallet is connected to my Vietnamese bank account at HSBC. And within a millisecond, the payment is done. And I say, come on, which is thank you very much. And I walk away. And in order to be able to live the digitalization, you actually have to, you have to see it working. I can describe it and you can say, oh, he made it up. And, and I didn't. And these kinds of encounters with the digital world you have on daily basis. It's a it's an absolutely fascinating journey of digitalization, and maybe this makes the loop complete from your first question: How did I, from a position of a head of HR, ended up in the world of digital payments? Yeah, I am perplexed myself. And three two, three years ago, I would have never thought that that, like I said, I would own eight different digital bank accounts just because I find it fascinating to see how and what they do differently in terms of client onboarding and and how they work. And now I spend time on researching and what they do and how they do it, this would never cross my mind three, four years ago. So it's been an absolutely fascinating journey. And Home Credit played a very important part in it and in my development. And so, yeah, very happy about it. Wonderful. You looped it very nicely at the very beginning of our conversation. So, Branjo, thank you very much for your time today. This was really interesting. And I hope others got a lot to take away from this as well. Have a wonderful day and speak to you soon. Thank you so much. I would like to thank everyone for listening. We're back soon with another war story from Inside the Vacuum. If you want to find out more about Branjo and the work he does over in Vietnam, feel free to check out the links in the podcast. You'll find out more. you find links to him and to the company that he represents. If you enjoyed this episode, please share this with your friends, your colleagues, and people who you think might find this interesting. And if you want to see these as they come out or listen to them as they come out, feel free to follow us on all the major podcast services or on our own website, inside.vacuumlabs.com. Have a wonderful week, and I hope you tune in next time. Take care.